All right, I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar. We have special guests Carl Fisher of Camel Plan and Chris Blasi of Neptune Global. They're going to be speaking about the highlights of uh, the economic impact of 2021 and moving for forward with the economy in 2022. Quick uh, disclaimer, uh, everything presented here today is for educational purposes. Cama Plan does not give any tax, legal, or investment advice. Consult with your you know, CPAs, attorneys, or other professionals before making any investments. This is my contact information. Anyone who's looking to get more information about self-directed IRAs or retirement accounts, I can be reached at 866-559-4430 or my email address rfisher at camaplan. And I look forward to speaking with you. Uh, quick background on Chris and I'll let him kind of take it over from here. And Chris, are you gonna share a screen or are you just gonna be speaking? Um, I may square, uh, share a screen later in our presentation because this is more of a conversational, but- okay. Um, well, I'll just leave this up then. And I want to say welcome, Chris and Carl. We'll just go ahead and get right into this. And uh, let's start with, you know, what you guys think is uh, most economical moving into 2022 and the wrap up of 2021. We'll start with you, Chris. Okay, well, 2021, I think, was an interesting year, um, not just for the obvious, um, you know, the aftermath of uh, coronavirus and COVID and the response to it. Um, and we, we, we've experienced things that we've never experienced in our lifetimes. Um, things like shortages, supply shortages, um, which, you know, regardless of crises in the past, whether it was the financial crisis of 2008, you know, crash, stock crash of 87. I was unfortunately around long enough to remember that uh, as a working person. And, uh, you know, we had a financial crisis in the early 90s and 98 we did, but um, nothing is like the experiences we had last year. And at the end of that, there are things that investors have not experienced in a long time. And I know there's a couple topics we're gonna touch on, uh, Ryan, but, we won't, I won't go into depth in it, but it's inflation. We now have inflation, which was being denied by the officials, right? Denying and calling it transitory. But now there's an acknowledgement that it's here and it's real and it's of some large numbers. And I'll just leave it at this and we'll address it more a little later. But investors have not had to safeguard their wealth, get a return on investment, a true return, you know, net of their costs and have to operate in an environment like this for over 30 years, right? We've been in a deep, if everything started deflating as far as interest rates and such. Um, once we had that spike that ended in really 1981, 82, and now investors have to rethink and change their playbook because we are back to an environment that we haven't experienced in three decades. And I guess I'll add to, to a little bit about what Chris said, because we were talking about that beforehand. Uh, the labor shortages are also in effect, not only product, but labor uh, are, are there. And I think 2021 was a significant year because the first part of it, we were still, still dealing with uh, COVID. I think COVID has, for the most part, um, uh, been, uh, you know, I, I saw specifics like 99% of the people uh, either had it or are uh, have been immune with at least one shot. And uh, I, I'm living in Florida and, and we have been open uh, for a while and we see, see things getting back to somewhat normal. But I think with the labor shortage, and the changes that are coming out of the pandemic, uh, I see that um, wages have increased, uh, which is hard to turn around. I see robots and kiosks are at their maximum orders ever in the United States. So 
I think both the inflation and the labor shortage uh, is going to be the earmarks of 2021. And I'm interested in what Chris's thoughts are, you know, as far as that subsiding in 2022, because the uh, Fed and, and uh, the uh, admin federal administration both said, uh, even Joe Biden said that the uh, inflation was transitory and that it would, you know, end in, in August or September of this year. And in my opinion, I see more empty shelves and higher prices today than I even saw in February. And just as an example, I mean, in, in September, but just as an example for any of you that are listening, just look at your Amazon app and take a look at what you paid for an article a year ago and what you can buy it for today and look at all of them. And I don't see anything that hasn't increased, at least on my Amazon uh, um, app, except for stuff that you can't get anymore. That's still the same price, but it's unavailable. Still sitting on the ships out there. But yeah, let's let Chris get into that. Is inflation transitory or is it short term, do you think? Okay, so one great thing, I have it on the record going way back. I actually did a webinar in the early spring with uh, Camaplan. And uh, I actually you know, could bring up a copy of those slides. When the Fed was telling everyone, first they denied there was inflation, then they said it was transitory. I said it's a, you know. And, and I have to be blunt, they lie, right? Because they want to manage the economy. They want to manage your perceptions, your perspective. Um, and I'm not the only one who called them on it. And then after a number of months, which they, you know, they thought that that transitory inflation that was experienced in the spring was supposed to subside come August. Well, here we are November. And not only did it not subside, but it's at a rate high, far higher than it was back in early spring. And, but this is what they will always do, whether it's the Fed, or Joe Biden, or any of them. They're always going to tell you something that's in their best interest as they try to manage your, um, your perspective and, of things. So as an, as an investor, you, you need to, I, I believe you need to be skeptical and really take everything they say with a grain of salt because you have Janet Yellen out there telling us how, don't worry, <clears throat> it'll all be, it's all going to pass soon. The reality is the momentum is for inflation. The, the cumulative effect of supply chain is, is there's a cumulative effect, right? So not only they're not delivering products and all things are just going into a bigger and bigger back order. These, these channels aren't going to clear for a long time and it's classic supply and demand. So there's fewer products and now the people that have the products want more money whether it's a new car, whether it's a hurricane impact window, or whether it's food in the, grocer, in the grocery store. And not only are the physical objects not available, but the labor isn't there and the labor to make the physical objects. So the point is this genie is out of the bottle, right? And it's being exasperated by all the money creation, right? People are losing faith in the US dollar, which is backed by nothing but faith. There's nothing tangible. And as we were talking prior, the, the government's put a lot of money into people's hands and they're demanding these products. <laughs> and, and this is just classic supply and demand. And I'll just say one other thing that's important. People like to say, oh, so it'll be like the 70s. It's actually gonna be worse. And it's gonna be worse for two reasons, um, for a couple of reasons. In the 1970s, we had supply and demand issues and such like we're having now. But in the 1970s, most of our products were actually manufactured in the US. We are now outsourced and we are completely at the mercy of countries like China to produce the vast majority of our products. So we're in a very, uh, very precarious state right now. And in my opinion, again, it's just my opinion, tune out everything you hear that says the Fed says, well, don't worry, we're going to hike uh, interest rates a little bit. Even if they were, it won't even be close to the inflation rate. So, right, Carl? When they, well, when they acknowledge 6.9% interest, well, what would they have to raise rates to get a, uh, a return on something that exceeds that? Well, they're not gonna raise rates to 7%. So my point is, it's not gonna happen. 
and investors need to change the playbook and look at what worked in highly inflationary environments 30 years ago um, for, to, to position and to protect their purchasing power, um, and, you know, the purchasing power that their investments generate going forward. Yeah, I mean, if you look at it 40 years ago, interest rates got up to 20%, but right now I don't think anybody can pull that trigger because our deficit and the interest we pay on our uh, debt would um, just suck suck the um, money out of the market. Um, but the other side of it is, I don't think we're on a doom and gloom um, path. Uh, I, you know, I don't know, you know, I'm not an economics major. I, I did, you know, I launched rockets and did engineering work um, in the past. So uh, the micro or the macroeconomics of this, I don't understand, but we were both listening to a couple of uh, great economists and uh, I think maybe a decade ago, Chris, and they said the United States uh, always finds a way to kick the can down the road. Um, and, you know, and I think Jim Rickards was there with the uh, currency wars. So I think, you know, it's a currency wars book. Is that where we are now? Uh, what is, is going to happen? Yeah, I mean, doom and gloom. I don't, you know, you have to, I, I would have to hear someone's definition of it, right? If someone thinks that high inflation is doom and gloom, then then it's doom and gloom. I think doom and gloom really means like everything comes to an end. Well, that's not going to happen. Things soldier on, but it's just going to be different. I think, you know, because of that perspective, it's called normalcy bias, right? When everyone says, well, this is the way it was for the last 10 years or 15 years or 20 years. So this is the way it always has to be. Well, that would, that's not a very uh, healthy way because things are always changing a little bit and kicking the can down the road is, you know, it doesn't mean the United States is coming to an end, of course not. But the United States have gone through periods of inflation in the past. And it was to me, um, not very, it wouldn't be very wise to believe that somehow we found a way to never have inflation again, and just keep, you know, a, a perpetual low interest rate, and never ending money printing to prop up every industry that starts to stumble. So we did that. And it really did it aggressively come in 2008 when the markets were imploding and all those bad debts were out there, all those bad loans, all those ninja mortgages, and the Fed came in and bought them all up because if they didn't, the economy would have collapsed. That was a can kick. Perfect. Sure. But people said there will be a price to pay in the future and they've never been able to stop the money printing and they've never been able to unwind that portfolio that the Fed bought of the trillions of bad loans from 1980. They're still on their books. And anytime they try to sell them back into the market, the market, the, the economy start to hiccup. So this is why you'll hear, not just from people like me, but other folks like a Rickards too, that they're stuck. They have to keep printing money. They can never unwind all the bad debt that they've accumulated. That's a propping of the economy. That's can kicking and you can continue to do it. But now there is a little bit of a, now there's a little bit of a price to pay and we're experiencing it through inflation. And people are saying, well, who are trying to defend the Fed's policy? No, no, it just has to do with because of coronavirus. That's not necessarily true. Coronavirus just accelerated the time when there's going to be a price to pay and we're paying it with higher inflation. Again, that's not doom and gloom, the world's not coming to an end, but investors need to shift gears, in my opinion, about where they put their money uh, as an investment. So what worked in the last, 10 years necessarily may not be the best um, strategy going forward. And that just really has to do with asset classes. That's hey, great, thanks, Chris. The, That's... Just since you and Carl brought it up, is this uh, the helicopter money that Jim Rickards speaks of in currency wars? Yeah, and they've been doing it since 2008. Well, all right, let's take that back. They were, they were doing quantitative easing to bail out the institutions the helicopter money is the money that was going out directly to people under because of quote unquote coronavirus and all the jobs that they were forced out of when everyone started locking down. Um, and that, that now you're getting to a much bigger topic because if you look at some of the legislation that they would like to pass that hasn't been passed though, right? You got the infrastructure bill, but there's a much bigger bill they'd love to push. You can see that there's a true 
move toward a much more social, uh, where socialism is much more a part of the system. And at the end of the day, if you read through it, they're really trying to push for universal basic income with, under the guise of what they call modern monetary theory. And that is a perpetual helicopter money. But yeah, we had helicopter money for the last year and a half. Well, Chris, what about the 120 billion that's been going into the uh, bond market? I mean, it used to be called quantitative easing and I've been hearing them talk about it and they're supposed to start, uh, you know, instead of paying 120 billion a month, I think in December, they're cutting it by 15 billion to 105. And that's uh, a great point, Carl, that is the tapering, right? So yeah. they, uh, you know, they call, they've been, they've been had quantitative easing one, two, three. I mean, there's been multiple instances of it since 2008, which again, don't let, don't let the quote unquote, the people who are trying to divert your attention. This, this problem has been going on through 2008. Now it's just accelerating. And this, again, these are these crazy perceptions. You, they say, oh, we're, we're going to start to taper, right? You would think that means, okay, we're going to stop create, buying. We're going to stop creating debt. We're going to stop creating money to buy bad debt and bonds from the government because that's what's happening. The Federal Reserve is buying the treasuries that the U.S. is issuing because the rest of the world doesn't want it. And they don't, they're, di they're divesting themselves of treasury bonds and treasury bills. But my point is, they said, okay, we're gonna start to taper. And you would think, okay, they're reversing course. No, all they're claiming is instead of 120 billion a month, we're gonna do 105, which come on, that's, you know, you're, you're still just printing money. Um, right, but they're gonna, they're gonna supposedly reduce it every month going down until they're not not giving anymore is that it would that be a good sign if they continue that and a bad sign if they don't well if they could actually do it but you know i again i submit this, they've been talking about doing this since 2014 they never unwound the bond, the bond buying that they did following the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009 they just jawbone they just tell people and then people you know believe them but they, they have never been able to, to do it. They start it and then they have to go right back and, 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 and in most cases even ramp up the amount of money printing and, and, uh, and buying of uh, bonds. So if you look at their track record and that we're in a much more tenuous situation now than we were um, when they couldn't do it before in 2014, 15, 16 and all those years, um, I just think it's nothing but talk and it, it's not going to uh, turn into anything, anything material as far as a pulling back on the money printing. So what do you think is, um, what do you think in 2022, what signs are you looking for and what assets would you uh, um, purchase? So, so, so I say we're, we're in a truly inflationary environment and there's a number of factors that are contributing to that. Uh, just um, investors beware, you're going to hear constant stories of uh, little anecdotal things that, well, inflation ticked down in one asset maybe, you know, but that doesn't matter. It, the, the hits are coming from so many different angles. So as I said before, in, the, in times of inflation, there are different asset classes, things that are more commodity related, um, things that are essential where the, um, the seller has the ability to pass the costs on. That would, you know, that's generally not good for things that are more discretionary. So if you have the ability to pass the costs on for like food, energy, you know, fuel, energy, um, that's, those are advantageous in my opinion. Uh, they worked very well in the 70s. You know, financial assets, financial stocks did horrendous in the 70s. Commodities did very well. People have been conditioned to stay away from them um, and pursue, you know, and if you look at a lot of the tech stocks where companies don't have earnings, but they were just memes, that's, you know, I, I think a lot of those are going to um, do very poorly in the next several years. So, you know, we're obviously involved in a, in a, in a market Neptune Global is that is very specific to assets that to tend to do very well under the conditions we're in. They've actually done very well quietly for 20 years, despite what you uh, may have been told in the mainstream media, but they are positioning 
and doing quite well right now. Um, actually outpacing every asset class, including its so-called um, replacement cryptocurrency. Um, the last couple of weeks alone, interestingly, Bitcoin, which was supposed to be a safe haven and an inflation hedge, has been performing poorly um, versus uh, traditional precious metals. So I'll just go back. Energy stocks have been doing very well. Commodities, a lot of uh, uh, resource stocks, that generally means um, uh, materials, uh, mining companies. In my opinion, those sorts of firms with the traditional hard asset behind them in some way, way or form, or companies that can pass, truly pass their costs on, those are gonna be the more attractive assets. Great, thanks, Chris. Let me just, so while you're on that topic, um, and I know you're an expert in this field, obviously. I mean, how hard are the metals to get a hold of now? And are the governments and the banks getting, you know, first dibs on the metals? I mean, I know it's been a hot topic and there's a lot of people um, buying gold and silver uh, from what I've seen. But if you want to elaborate on that, go ahead. Sure. So, you know, I always have always said, and I've, you know, I've had the opportunity to come on periodically and, and talk with the PAMA folks, that um, the, uh, what's really important is the looking at who's buying the metals, even when we call the retail investors aren't buying it. And central banks of the world have been aggressively buying it for 10 years, a little bit longer, and they've actually just keep ramping up. And that's... That's a tell, that's a sign that what they see coming. Um, so, um, I would look at their playbook and follow what they're doing. So, um, for as far as uh, uh, investors, um, I just, you know, Carl, could you jump a minute to just have a little tech? Yeah, yeah, yeah no, no problem. Um, one of the things that I wanted to uh, talk about that Chris said on those assets, I've always believed that uh, real estate is more local than it is national. And I can't, you know, I can't say or uh, I can't um, emphatically say that that's as important today or more important today than it's ever been. Uh, and I th think a lot of the reasons is the taxes, the uh, post-COVID world we're living in, there is some more uh, remote working from that aspect. So I understand that the um, uh, real estate, I think, is still a good play, uh, but you have to be very careful in what areas you're going to uh, approach it. And you've also got to look at the type of real estate. Storage uh, space is... Uh, pretty good all over the country. Uh, commercial space, as an example, is not as good in New York as it is in Florida. And residential space uh, in the Sun Belt is better than it is, uh, you know, in the Northwest and the uh, um, North Central United States, et cetera. So the other uh, last thing I'd like to say is if, they do raise interest rates in my world of the old world. It's been um, uh, when interest rates go up to the public, uh, real estate prices go down and the stock market also goes down. So I am watching the interest rates and I hope what Chris says uh, that it's going to be awful hard for them to raise the rates much at all. Um, sorry about that, to raise the rates at all will be good for both the stock market and the real estate market. But I've never seen things go on uh, forever without having some sort of cycle in there. Well, Great, about thank you. Um, so Chris, I'm just going to jump over to uh, a quick question for you. Which economic scenarios are most likely for 2022 and how likely are they to affect investors? I think it's that I think one of the most fundamental things in all investing is interest rates. That's why, I mean, people become obsessed with what Fed policy is, right? Because 
that's about money creation and interest rates, which is kind of foundational to every business. So the, again, the paramount, um, the most important thing for investors is going to be the inflation and your asset class and how does that perform in those environments, right? So the cost of money, um, I, yeah, I'm not an expert in every class, you know, but real estate is very, uh, obviously interest rates are the foundation of the real estate market. Um, I'm an expert in, um, in what we call an alternative money or the ultimate money, which are the metals. Um, and I just want to elaborate from before that we are already seeing, even though it's not, you don't see the masses piling in, they will. Um, we are already experiencing shortages in a lot of, in some of the metals that are very common for the retail investor. And that's predominantly the silver. So silver is already getting tight supplies. Um, I've also shared in past um, webinars, the charts that show the cycles for the metals. You know, and I have them from 2015, where we showed our forecast of where we would be. Um, and I could even bring them up because I do have them as a, on a share screen if I could. Or oh uh, yeah, let me stop now. share. And then also leading in off of that, how can investors prepare now for the coming year, but remain flexible is where I want to go after that. Uh, you should be able to share yours now, Chris. Well, that's, that's a great point. So you want, you want flexibility and I, you know, we, we deal in asset class that's very flexible, right? Because it trades real time. You can buy and sell in real time. Um, so obviously also a lot of commodities, people purchase commodities or participate through the market, the stock market, right? Um, again, this is just opinions. I'm not a financial advisor, but those are, those are very flexible and have liquidity and allow you to, to pivot in and out of positions and rotate. So, um, you know, I, I think in the environment we're in, you do want that kind of flexibility and the ability to rotate and pivot. So I know what we we're involved in, we can do that. Um, a lot of resource investing you can do because they're really just, uh, uh, you're buying it through uh, exchange traded products. Um, Carl would be much more uh, an expert when it comes to things related to real estate. So, well, the, yeah, I, I, your points are well taken. And I do like the metals from, from that aspect, because what I look at is when I'm getting, you know, a half a percent, um, you, you know, or a tenth of a percent on, on a bank account with cash, even though people call cash is king, um, and the inflation is 7%, that means I'm losing, you know, 6.9% uh, um, or more by having my money in the bank. So I'm looking for other assets that I can put out there. And you, you mentioned commodities earlier, Chris. I mean, I can go buy you know, a couple of cords of uh, two by fours, which I think are plywood that's going going around. And, you know, if I'm in Florida, I can probably sell the plywood, um, you know, when a hurricane comes, uh, you know, and, and make a, make some money on it. But it's very um, unsettling to me to worry about my money in the bank losing uh, based on interest. Um, so, should I buy the two by fours already built in a house? Should I, you know, put them in a warehouse and pay the storage? Uh, I mean, I know in the in the metals you pay the insurance and in store for that also, but it's not nearly as expensive as the, uh, um, you know, if I, I rent a warehouse for, you know, I don't know, oil or uh, wheat, um, or two by fours, you know, obviously I don't want to be buying something that can spoil or the rats can get in and eat. Uh, so those commodities are kind of off, off the list. And the other ones, you know, are, um, uh, you know, hard, hard places and take up a lot of volume. So that's the types of assets I'm looking for, for 2022, because right now I don't see at least for the first half of 2022, I don't see inflation subsiding. Uh, I'm going to look and see if they get that uh, two billion plus uh, reconciliation bill. I don't even know what they're calling it now, 
But if they get that passed, I'm just thinking that inflation is going to go up even more. Um, I wish I'd bought, you know, two or three more houses, uh, you know, last year uh, because I would have made money on them. So, but, you know, my hindsight is 2020, but looking forward, I want to pay attention to what the government's spending. They already passed the, the, the infrastructure bill. So now if I'm going to be investing in stocks or bonds or businesses, I'm going to see who's, who uh, is going to get that money or get a lot of that money from the uh, infrastructure bill. And I think it's a lot of the green companies and I think it's a lot of the internet companies uh, and probably construction companies and material companies, but that all has to be looked at and I've got to go study that bill. But I don't want to ramble on. That's what I'm looking at for at least the first half of 2022. So I don't see my money in the bank dwindle by, you know, six or seven percent. Well, while you're talking about bills there, and you both can comment on this, is, you know, Congress's pending reconciliation bill, more f fuel for the inf inflationary fire, regardless of the price tag? Carl? Um, yeah, I mean, if they spend any more money, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to raise inflation. I mean, we've spent more money now. I mean, I feel like we're spending like a drunken sailor. Um, and that's not said with any disrespect, but I've never seen it in my lifetime. That's why I don't know that we're living in the same rules. I mean, I've had the pandemic. I've seen the, the CDC tell me I can't evict people out of, out of apartments, uh, you know, or houses that I'm renting. Um, so yeah, I, I, I feel like I'm in a, in a brand new world and, and I haven't gotten you know, I, I feel like I went to sleep and I woke up, you know, in a different, if it, in a different age. So yes, I, I think if they spend any more money, I, I think the inflation is just going to get worse unless I'm missing something. Well, yes. And I don't, I, again, they're not going to stop. Everything is actually being more and more politicized, unfortunately. Uh, so if you look through those bills, they're not, they're not, in my opinion, they're not uh, genuine as far as true infrastructure bills and, you know, building real infrastructure for the benefit of all. A lot of it is bailing out cities and pumping money into, you know, in areas that can't sustain themselves. And, um, but I, you know, again, I, I kind of shared before that in my personal portfolio, because I, I do like to have my hand in different parts of the market. So there's, there's no experience like being involved in them. The, the things that are performing best in my personal portfolio are, as I said before, the things that were the best types of stocks 30 years ago in inflationary environments that have been out of favor for a long time, namely energy and food. Um, and actually, my utilities are doing well um, because they do have the ability to pass on their costs. Um, and you're seeing this, this uh, rotation of, uh, of these meme stocks, right? And I think going forward, a lot of stocks that are meme stocks that really didn't even have earnings, but people just chase them. And that includes a vast majority of the tech stocks that they are not going to do as well. And uh, the, the ho-hum dull industries like, you know, energy production and explorers and, and, and food, the people that can supply, um, control the food chain, um, they're doing quite well. So, um, and I think that'll carry through all the way through 22 quite easily. So, um, you know, you can be reevaluate things six, nine months from now. But me personally, again, just as my opinion, I think those are going to continue to do well because as well as they have done for me, they're not the asset classes that you would see the, the, the majority of people piling into yet. So, um, you know, I think there's a lot of, a lot of runway in front of them. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, I was going to say, uh, I'm going to let you get to your few points here, and uh, then we'll follow up with a few questions. I also want to let uh, everybody know out there, if they do have a question for you or Carl, you can put it in the Q&A or the chat box, and we'll uh, try to answer all of those in this time frame. All right. Yeah, just a couple of things, because, you know, I shared this a long time ago, and it's, you know, I, I like I'm sharing it only because... I hope that, you know, people see that, you know, our perspective, we, we tend to have um, 
some insights that are correct or, or mostly. Um, and this is what I would call man management of perspective. You know, the stock market is where the powers that be want you to keep your money. And it did well. Um, this goes back since the, the precious metals market started their bull market 20 years ago, secular bull market, right? There's three legs to it, which I'll show. Um, this is just goes to show with all the talk about there's no better place in the stock market. In the last 20 years, gold handily outdid the stock market. You'd never know that by the mainstream media. But just you know, the first trade Neptune did was $288 an ounce in gold. It's just under 1900, you know, 1865 right now. But here's something, this was from a camel webinar published in 2015. And um, what I at the time. You see, there was, I said, there's three legs to every bull market in gold. And the first leg is your big rise up. The second leg is a 50% retracement. And then the third is gonna be your biggest and most robust. So at the time in 2015, this is where it was. The green line is the 50% retracement and hadn't gotten there yet. But I had said, this looks like a classic bull market, secular bull market. This is the way they trade. And when you, if you subscribe to that, then you invest accordingly. So that's 2015, almost six years ago, or five and a half, well, six and a half years ago. Here's one, the webinar in 2020. So over a year ago. And what happened? In that time, it hit exactly. I mean, this was like, this is a textbook secular market, secular bull market. It hit the 50% retracement. And the 50% retracement is a retracement from the gain made in leg one. And I said, we are now in the third leg. And this is the um, this is your biggest leg. And then where is gold right now? You can see um, it's at $1,865 an ounce before we started this webinar and climbing. So my point is, this is, we're not, I'm not, we're not, a, I'm not a Johnny come lately. We said this six years ago. This is how it's going to probably play out. We reiterate it in 2020 and a year and a half later, it's exactly what's happening. So my point is now, and this is based on a, on a, on a asset that is quote unquote an inflation hedge. And all this time inflation was being denied or was very subdued. Now we're actually getting, we're hitting the stride. And therefore, this is why you saw that precious metals do so well the last couple of weeks, because now that there's the acknowledgement that there's inflation, it is really coming into its own. And it decoupled from the cryptocurrencies that were vying for investors' um, attention or their funds saying, well, we're the new goal, or we're the new inflation hedge. Well, that fell flat on its face, especially this week where Bitcoin has lost about $7,000 an ounce, or excuse me, a Bitcoin. So this is just, um, and this the reason it's important is, I think in the times we're in, especially for the next year or so, when inflation is going to be materially impacting investment performance, you, there are the universe for assets that perform well in this sort of environment is much smaller than it was before. Because before, when everyone's chasing meme stocks, you had technology stocks going up with companies that had no earnings. Well, it's easy to go to market with a company that has no earnings. It's hard to go to market with an asset or a company that not only has earnings, but can keep up and exceed the rates of inflation. And gold is not a company, but it's a store of wealth that is the ultimate form of money that moves you know, inversely to the dollar. And as inflation, you know, the dollar goes down in times of inflation and it's purchasing power versus gold and the other precious metals. So there's obviously been a number of CAMA clients through the years. And we, you know, a lot of our clients are, have precious metals in their IRA. And, you know, we're, we're happy that we feel they're very well positioned going forward. So, so here's the question I want answered now. So where's the peak of this third leg? Ah, uh, that you don't, the, they, they always call, it ends in what they call a parabolic blow-off, all right? And that happens in, in not just metals, but anything that goes through a market like this. You'll know a parabolic blow-off because it'll go straight up. Um, 
similar to the end of leg one. If you look at here, this part of leg one, uh -huh. right? It, you saw the metals moving up. And this was a tremendous move up and up and up and up. And then it just shot up in the summer of 2000. And that was getting ahead of itself. And then it did its consolidation period to the 50% retracement. And there's just for people that appreciate technical analysis and charts, this is what they call the cup and handle. This is the, in the world of charting, this is the most bullish uh, picture that you can see. They call the cup and handle because you have a peak, you go down on the retracement, you go back up, you exceed that peak a little bit, you do a consolidation, and then you take off. This is um, this chart is from several months ago. Gold is really right here right now, and this, and then this is that power with the, what you asked Carl the parabolic move up. Now we're yeah. a ways before that parabolic move happens, um, but leg three always exceeds greatly the gains of leg one, and so, similar for silver. So, Chris, with that being said, what are your expectations and do you have any timeline? Sure. So my hope is that this rise in leg three doesn't happen too quick. Um, I hope it grinds on and that's for being in the business. Uh, and, and it's in our all our best interest that the well, the dollar devalues, because as gold is rising, that's going to be again, negatively correlated to the purchasing power of the dollar. So you don't want it to just crumble too much. I hope we go through, I believe we'll go through multiple years of um, very healthy gains like we did in 2001 through 2011. These were fantastic years. I hope we go to something like that before we hit the parabolic blow off. Um, you know, other, other analysts, I don't put numbers out there, but other analysts are looking at targets of minimum of 5,000 and higher when the market, when the bull market closes um, for gold in this secular run. I hope it comes over a period of years and not too quickly, meaning like seven, you know, five years, not just two. But uh, my point is, I believe, and the environment has now set this up to confirm what these charts have been telling us is coming our way, that these metals will give a very healthy return for a number of years going forward. So I believe it's a very important component to all portfolios. And if anyone says, well, how much should be in there? I would never gonna give you a percentage. I'll just say you want it to be meaningful enough so that it carries parts of your portfolio that will be, may underperform because of the environment we're in. Well, I heard an economist say that when the ship's sinking, you want a life preserver, not a picture of one. Right. So yeah. having real gold versus ETFs, what's your thoughts there? That's a great point. So a lot of ETFs are really just loaded with derivatives. Derivatives are not actually owning the asset. Carl pointed out a very good point earlier. The thing about commodity investing is most commodities you can't have your hands on. Right. You, you can't have oil in your backyard. Right. You can't put a silo full of grain, you know, or, or piles of copper. So you're, you're required and really your only option are to buy mining companies or firms that um, you're buying stock in a, in a company that is tied to that market, but not the direct commodity, the not direct asset. The precious metals are unique again in that you could actually own the direct asset. Now, Wall Street has created things like ETFs and other funds um, because that's in their best interest, but I don't believe it's in yours. And the beauty is with firms like self-directed IRA firms like Camaplan, a, a person could actually own directly the commodity, the asset, and not have a securitized layer between them and the underlying asset. So I always believe that is not a benefit that you should uh, not capitalize on, right? You're not forced to have to buy a derivative in order to participate in this market because derivatives have a lot of shortcomings, but you can actually control um, the underlying asset. So, and luckily, um, our, our, our laws and such allow the individual investors to do that both inside an IRA and even outside. 
Glad you mentioned that too, but let's, uh, I've seen an uptick in it. How, is there a big percentage of your clients investing using their, you know, self-directed IRAs? Yes, I, I would actually say in the last um, couple of years, we see a um, more and more participation of self-directed IRA um, clients either moving uh, or taking positions in gold or clients of ours who are, you know, saying, hey, how do I, you know, can I use my IRA money, you know, from a rollover or something to buy physical metals? So, of course, you know, we, we have to... Um, introduce them to a custodian and administrator like yourselves. Um, but that is definitely gaining in popularity. And the more that people are starting to realize that the metals, gold is the, um, or all the precious metals are the safe haven asset in this environment, you know, we're, we're seeing more and more inquiries on that. And there's actually been pieces now, and now it's coming out in all the mainstream media, whether it's the Wall Street Journal over the last couple of days or Goldman Sachs, are now acknowledging the move toward gold as a safe haven asset in these times, in these inflationary times. Can the price of gold, Chris, um, give you a, be a leading indicator of what's coming next? That, Carl, that's a great point, and because it is, it is a, it is a leading, and it's a tell, and that's why I would say these charts. So when you saw the, the, the leg down, it basically just said gold was anticipating a long-term problem with the dollar versus the dollar price of gold, meaning that the U.S. dollar was going to devalue. It got, it got ahead of itself. It gets up there. And then, of course, there was a lot of jawboning and people said, you know, all right, the, the Fed will get things under control because realize this blow off was pre-2008. And then it just really accelerated after the financial crisis of 2008-9. Then everyone started to believe the stories like they would be able to reverse quantitative easing and take all that printed, you know, all that debt that they bought and, you know, and take it off the Fed's balance sheet. But then around 2000, actually December 2015, the market said, we don't believe you. And the gold market starts calling the bluff on the Fed. Now, the the majority of people didn't believe it. They were still believing the Fed, but gold was rising because they knew the Fed will never be able to change the position they're in from the nonstop money printing, would never be able to unwind the trillions of dollars that they had bought to prop up the economy and the banks and, and you name it. And now you just have this confirmation and that's why this chart is saying no, we're going to have inflation and we're going to have a lot of it coming on us really quickly now. And that's so the Fed is telling you, don't worry, it's transitory, it's going to end. The gold market, who's been right really for 20 years as a tell of what's coming, is, is calling their bluff. This market, the gold market, and realize this is not being driven by retail. This is driven by sovereign wealth funds, central bank buying and very, very you know, powerful entities who really are, have a seat at the table to know what's happening in the world. So you know, I would defer and say, no, the picture is telling us inflation is real, inflation is not transitory, and it's gonna be with us, and it's gonna be you know, probably rising aggressively in the next, next couple of years. So if, if that's the case, it's probably also good to be in stocks uh, of companies that, as you said earlier, can pass on their costs to consumers uh, as consumers have saved money as a result of the pandemic, the government giveaways and no place to spend the money. So maybe the uh, stock market still has, you know, more of a bull run in it as well as gold. Well, the stock, you know, I would say, again, it, it depends on the stocks, right? It's a rotation. Right. For me. Again, these are my opinion. As I shared before, the stocks that are doing very well in my portfolio, because again, I, I do want to be in other asset classes to see, to experience them, have been energy stocks, food producers, companies like Tyson Foods and General Mills and Exxon and uh, Coterra Energy. These, these companies are not have been out of favor for a long time, but I went in 
to them over a year ago because you know I believe they're they're going to come back and everyone was still just chasing meme stocks you know a lot of companies without even earnings a lot of tech stocks and you know all you know again what they they, stir, they refer to them as meme stocks now so I see there's a sector rotation and for a lot of these you have to do it through the stock market now does that mean the overall market goes up I mean may, maybe not maybe because the drop in certain you know, tech stocks may be so great that the gain in the energy stocks doesn't completely offset it. But like anything else, I just, you know, I think investors need to reallocate and re reevaluate what asset classes they're in and just and look at each asset class they're in and say, is this good? Is this going to perform well in the environment we're in now? This is an environment we haven't experienced for 30 years. So, you know, the playbook has to be adjusted, in, in my opinion. Yeah, well, yeah, but those stocks that you mentioned, Chris, were the ones that I'm thinking of because I know right now, you know, I go to the grocery store, uh, eggs are up, you know, 50% from where they were. I go to the gas pump and, and you know, I just, just filled my car and it cost me $85 um, where it used to be $45. Um, so, I think if you're looking at those stocks, the stocks that can easily pass the cost of inflation um, onto the consumer uh, are probably the, the stocks to uh, be in uh, in the future. Uh, I don't know that for a fact, but it just makes sense to me because I, I'm thinking, hey, buy businesses that can push their costs onto the consumer. Yeah. And, uh -huh. Yeah, we're in agreement. Okay. Yeah, but cool. again, it's, it's rotation because I think a lot of portfolios, you know, in the stock market, and I'm not, a, I'm not a stock, you know, I'm not an advisor for stocks, but there's just a basic logic that I know what stocks have gone up the most in the last 10 years. And there, a lot of it is even with companies that don't even have earnings, right? Yeah. Uh, a lot of the tech stocks have no earnings. I mean, I was... <laughs> I have to, I was texted the other day from my son talking about, I think it's called Rivens. They, Riven, uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Here's a the electrical car company. Yeah. Stock that just came out, took off like unbelievable in price. They have never produced a car. Right. So but, you know, this is the type of meme investing that is to me personally um, divorced from any fundamentals or reality. And that that worked very well for the last 10 years, but I think going forward, it's not gonna work as well. That you're actually going to have to make a product. Not only, have, not only are they not producing income, they haven't even made a product. They're just saying, we're gonna make electric cars. I mean, you know. Well, they also had a thousand of them ordered by Amazon. So, but like you said, they still gotta, they still gotta make it. And I don't understand that that world myself. That's why I said I feel like Rip Van Winkle and I fell asleep and woke up in a different uh, era. Um, yeah, but the but the good thing I'll say is when you know I took these positions, um, they're playing out. So it's not just speculation, right? I mean, maybe it hasn't taken off as much as ribbons, but you know, Exxon for me personally in the last year is up over you know twenty seven percent. You know, there's a there's a classic energy stock that suffered for many years, right? This used to be a darling, but has been in decline for over a decade prior. And everyone kind of lost sight of it. It was paying a tremendous dividend, but it was, no one was interested, no matter how great the dividend was, because it wasn't the meme of the moment, but it's done very well. So um, I'm just more comfortable in that. You know, I guess there'll always be certain meme stocks that'll take off. That to me, that's more like, you know, the luck of the draw than, you know, a, a sound plan. Yep. Uh, hope, hope is a strategy for some of that stuff, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. All righty. Well, let's um, move forward here on both of your final thoughts. And then let's, uh, if you both can end with uh, some key uh, takeaways for investors moving forward. Carl? Um, what was your first? 
what are the key takeaways today? I think yeah, just uh, your your final thoughts and key takeaways for investors moving forward. Uh, I think uh, inflation is going to continue into 2022. I don't think it's transitory. I don't think uh, prices are are going to go back down uh, significantly uh, from where they are either in real estate. Uh, you know, I don't think the precious metals is there. I think the dollar, the value of the dollar will continue to erode. Uh, I think you should be buying stocks or businesses uh, that are um, inflation resistance. I like real estate that is rented because rental income goes increases go right along with uh, wage increases uh, and home increases, et cetera. And if inflation doesn't go up, then the price of homes are going to stay high as well. So I think that you've got to watch where you where you're investing today. I think it's different than any other time uh, uh, in my lifetime because of the supply shortages uh, to the extreme portion that they are, and the world GDP is out there, and we don't have a lot of supply. Uh, manufacturing companies in the U.S. So we've got to have a lot more uh, imports, I believe, in the future. I just, um, you know, this isn't doom and gloom. It's uh, actually the playbook has to change. That means there's opportunity. I think the smart, the smart folks embrace it right away and get in early. And that's how you do better, right? You do better than the next guy say, you know what, I'm going to acknowledge that there's a change and I'm going to pivot to what's going to capitalize on and what's coming. So, you know, don't look at it as a negative, just look at it as change and change always happens. And I, I said this earlier, the, the, I think the biggest um, impediment to successful investing over the longer term is the normalcy bias, thinking that, okay, what I've been experiencing for the last five or 10 years is that's it in perpetuity. Um, it's never been like that in the history of the world, so it will never be like that. Um, you always have to be prepared and do your due diligence, do your homework, and, and take advantage. And in, in, in some respects, it's a blessing. You know, changes like this allow the field to, to change and mix up a little and allows people who are, you know, going out and doing their homework a, a chance to, to, to really outperform. So um, I would look at it from that positive perspective. And, you know, the one thing about the metals, I would look at it this way for a lot of investors. It's a way to, to safeguard your wealth, keep its purchasing power. And then as things maybe settle down in a, two years from now, um, then you, you, you come out and you come out more whole with your purchasing power. And then you, you're going to have more ammunition to deploy in, you know, future assets as, you know, one bull market, one secular bull market moves from one asset class to the next. I'd like to add one thing into there based on the old reconciliation bill. It looks like the government took aim on retirement accounts and specifically Roth accounts. So if anybody doesn't have a Roth account, I would at least get one open uh, just in case they uh, um, try to curtail opening up of Roth accounts in the future. I would get one open and you can figure out whether or not, you know, to what extent you want to use it. But I'm afraid that if you don't have one, you might not be able to get one in the future. Other than that, I want to tell you, thanks, Ryan, for uh, moderating our discussion here. And I hope that uh, all your listeners uh, learned something and hopefully they are uh, in the process of, uh, making the changes necessary for 2022. Great. Well, I want to thank uh, you, Carl and Chris, for your guys' insight here moving forward and look forward to uh, connecting with you guys again. Thanks, Ryan. Carl, it's great to be with you again. Yeah, we'll see where we are in 2022. We'll do this again. Absolutely. <laughs> have a great day. Uh, you, guys you guys have a great day too. Bye-bye.